Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for CNN's second annual virtual symposium, Advances in Drug Discovery and Development. I'm Amanda Yarnell, Managing Editor for Editorial at CNN, and I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker, Robert Plenge, Vice President at Merck Research Labs in Boston. He is founder and worldwide head of, he of the Department of Genetics and Pharmacogenomics, and earlier this year launched Merck's new translation medicine department. Robert's talk today will focus on redefining translational medicine for efficient drug discovery. I'm, ex starting, I'm excited to hear how human genetics can contribute to drug discovery and development and to learn more about the role that biomarkers and clinical proof of concept studies play in testing therapeutic hypotheses. I'll be back to moderate a Q&A session immediately following the presentation. I welcome your questions at any time. Just click the green Q&A button in the left corner of your screen. And if you need any technical assistance during the presentation, please click on the support button located at the top right of your screen. And now I'll turn it over to Robert. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Um, again, this is, uh, this is Robert Plenge at uh, Merck Research Labs, and um, I will be speaking to you for the next half hour on redefining translational medicine uh, for efficient uh, drug discovery. So I, I want to start just by defining what, what I consider to be uh, the, the fundamental problem um, in, in drug discovery. Uh, while there are, are many, I think it can actually be distilled uh, into um, uh, two key uh, issues. Um, the first has to do with the very high uh, failure rate uh, of programs in uh, phase two and phase three of drug development. Um, so as you can see in the slide, uh, in the figure on, on the left, um, the cost of drug discovery continues to go up. And much of the cost can be attributed not to the successes, but rather can be attributed uh, to, to the failures uh, of drug discovery. Uh, but the second problem is a bit more difficult to describe. It's actually uh, around the, um, the rising uh, healthcare costs and the demand for innovative uh, breakthrough therapies. Um, it's, it's very important that the drug discovery industry not just deliver uh, medicines that work and deliver them at a lower cost, but also deliver medicines um, that will drive down uh, the cost of, of health care and improve the lives of patients. And I like to think of these two problems um, as the first one is the, the attrition problem, that is too many things fail. Um, and then the, the second problem is the, the innovation problem. Um, again, that is we need to create innovative um, um, uh, therapies that ultimately drive down the, the cost of, of health care. Um, with regards to the, um, the, the attrition problem, um, this has actually changed, uh, this has changed over time. Um, so in the 1990s, uh, the failures were due to uh, drug metabolism and pharmacokinetics and, and pharmacodynamics, uh, DMPK. And so as shown um, in the, uh, the, the silver box here, about 40% of failures could be attributable to, to DMPK. Um, and in contrast, at that time, uh, about 30% of failures could be attributed to, to efficacy. Today, however, um, this has actually changed. And now the majority of failures are due to um, efficacy. You can see fa phase two failures in 2008 to 2010, over half were due to uh, failures due to efficacy. And this number was even larger um, for phase uh, three failures. So that is, you know, despite all of the wonderful preclinical work that's done, and, and despite the phase one studies that hopefully should establish proof of concept, uh, many things still fail because they, they just don't work in humans. Um, the second problem is uh, the innovation problem. And, and here I like to uh, cite Amazon as an example of, of challenges that are similar to what we face in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, so what, what Amazon has said is, is we want to be the Earth's um, a most customer-centric company, um, and where the customers can find and discover everything that they might want to buy online, and importantly, at the lowest possible prices. That is, not only do they want to deliver innovation, they want to deliver innovation that drives down um, the cost of the retail business. And I think in the pharmaceutical industry, I think we have an obligation not only to, uh, to deliver 
uh, innovative therapeutic products, but also ultimately to drive down uh, the cost uh, of, of health care. So I think many people would actually wouldn't argue with those two fundamental challenges of the drug discovery and development process. The, the challenge, of course, is, well, how, how do we fix it? Um, and what are the guiding principles uh, towards uh, addressing these fundamental challenges? And what, what I'd like to talk about today um, are what I see as, as three key guiding principles. Um, and the first has to do with the very front end of the drug discovery process uh, around target ID and validation. That is deciding which targets we pursue at the very beginning of a drug discovery process. And I'll talk about this more over the course of the presentation, but I actually think one of the key issues is around defining which targets, when perturbed, have a desired effect on human physiology. And I refer to this as causal human uh, biology. But the second main, second main um, uh, guiding principle is around developing biomarkers that are going to capture this human biology. They're going to capture causal human biology. And, and these biomarkers um, can measure therapeutic modulation, um, not in a preclinical model, that, that's useful as well, but ultimately in, in a human system. And this is more than just target engagement. This actually has to do with a therapeutic uh, molecule binding to the target and modulating it in a way that recapitulates the underlying causal human biology. The third important uh, guiding principle is around testing therapeutic hypotheses in humans as quickly and efficiently as possible um, in clinical proof of concept clinical trials. And, and I will differentiate um, uh, proof of biology, proof of mechanism, and proof of concept in, in clinical trials. Ultimately, it's proof of concept that determines whether a drug uh, will be successful and therefore approved. And I think that if we can address these fundamental principles, that ultimately this will deliver um, a portfolio of projects into phase two and phase three clinical trials that have a higher probability of success, and not just success for being approved, but also success for delivering um, breakthrough therapies. So another way to think about this is uh, about the past versus the future. I think technology is changing the way we think about drug discovery and development. And it is changing the ideal mo model organism for drug discovery and, and development. So it used to be that most of the targets were identified in preclinical species because they're just they're more tractable in terms of understanding biology. Um, and that drugs were developed based upon these model organisms and then taken into heterogeneous patient populations. I think what we're trying to go uh, uh, in, in the future is to use humans as the ideal model organism, not just for identifying new targets, but also for precision medicine. So increasingly technology allows us to understand human biology, differentiate cause and consequence, define those targets that when perturbed are gonna have the desired effect. We still, and there still is a very important role of preclinical animal model to test um, uh, aspects of pharmacology and to test safety. Um, but ultimately, we want to try to translate human observations into precise patient populations um, in small clinical trials. Okay. Um, I, we'll spend the remainder of the time going over uh, several examples. Um, I'll focus on um, uh, human genetics uh, throughout um, uh, as one component of causal human biology. Um, but to say from the outset, uh, human genetics is not the only way uh, to define uh, new uh, drug targets. So just to make sure we level set on, on what the challenge is with target identification and how human genetics can help. So in, in the, uh, on the left, I'm showing you um, what I'm calling, I'll use this term as, as target. I think probably most people are familiar with that. But if you have a disease state, something abnormal, you can then define this as a target, you develop a drug against it, and then um, much simpler on this particular slide, of course, but that takes a disease state into a healthy state, right? This is, this is what we tr hope to accomplish. But the challenge is shown here on the right. There are tens of thousands of potential targets in the human body, and it's really hard to know which ones cause disease. And even if you thought you were quite convinced that this particular target is somehow causally related to the disease process, 
There is also another level of complexity, which is how do you actually perturb that target to fix the underlying disease state? So how can human genetics help? Um, human genetics can help identify differences, germline differences, in individuals that distinguish disease individuals, and that's shown in red, from healthy individuals, and that's shown in right. And if you can do this, this, at least in theory, should unveil new targets, which could be the starting point of a drug discovery process. And there are several key steps um, uh, to uh, translate human genetics into successful drug discovery programs. Um, first is that it's important to map genetic differences in those with disease versus those without disease. Um, and I say disease, this could also be a quantitative uh, trait or some other physiologic measurement that you think is relevant to drug discovery. Uh, second is to understand how these genetic differences lead to this disease state or this quantitative state, some physiologic measurement that you think is important um, to, to health and, and, and to disease. And then third is to develop drugs against these targets that somehow reverse this underlying pathological process. And, and I want to be clear, I don't mean gene therapy necessarily, although that's one uh, potential way to reverse an underlying uh, disease process. What I actually mean is to have a drug that actually somehow modulates the target and reverses either that target or that sort of underlying um, uh, pathophysiology. So I'll go over just a couple of examples. I think that most people are probably familiar with the example of, of, uh, of uh, human genetics, PCSK9, and LDL lowering, but I'll just walk you through this example very quickly. Um, so as I'm showing in the upper left, there are many genes which influence um, cholesterol levels and the risk of heart disease in the healthy population. Um, thanks to a number of new technologies, such as genome-wide association studies and next generation sequencing, we can now identify um, these genetic differences in those with disease versus those without disease. Um, the next challenge, of course, is to translate this into an underlying kind of biological model. In the case of PCSK9, um, through animal model studies and other um, uh, preclinical studies, both in humans and in model organisms, um, it was understood that PCSK9 is involved in LDL receptor recycling um, and that LDL, PCSK9 can actually bind to, help internalize, and therefore degrade the LDL receptor. Um, and loss of function mutations led to lower LDL cholesterol and protection from cardiovascular disease, which then implied and, and generated this therapeutic hypothesis that a monoclonal antibody against PCSK9 would recapitulate this biology lead to more LDL uh, receptor on the surface of, the, of cells and therefore more internalization of LDL cholesterol and more clearance of LDL cholesterol uh, from the blood. <coughs> um, so in addition to anecdotal uh, examples such as PCSK9, um, there's also evidence that portfolios of projects based upon human genetics have a higher probability of success. And again, success means efficacy in phase two and phase three clinical studies. Um, this is a Nature Reviews drug discovery um, uh, our article uh, on AstraZeneca's pipeline that was published a, a couple of years ago. Um, and what this actually shows is that you know, they see something quite similar in terms of, uh, of, of in phase two and in, in phase two A and two B, um, many of the failures are due to safety um, and also in uh, efficacy. Um, and if you ask, well, what factors predict success? Um, human genetics is one aspect which actually doubles the probability that um, a program will be successful um, in phase two. Another predictor of success is to have biomarkers and to have biomarkers that are efficacy biomarkers based upon um, ideally um, causal human biology. And so these are two important um, predictors of success. Um, I'll also point you to a recent um, uh, nature genetics study by Matt Nelson um, and his colleagues at, at GSK, and, and they show something uh, actually quite similar. Um, again, portfolios of, prod, of, 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 um, of, of programs based upon human genetics uh, have a higher probability of success. And what they're showing in the graph um, on the right is the um, uh, odds that 
um, a program will be successful and whether that there is genetic data from um, Mendelian disorders or OMIM, whether it's genetic dis data from uh, GWAS um, uh, databases as well. And I think the bottom line here again is that genetic data predicts um, uh, successful drug discovery programs. Okay, so uh, there'll be a theme here which I always say, sure, human genetics is useful, but what's the strategy? I'm sure we have these problems such as attrition and, and innovation, but what is the strategy? And so what, what I'd like to do is spend a few minutes just talking about what is the genetic strategy? How can we actually think about how to use human genetics to establish causal links and again to identify novel drug targets? Um, so the way I like to frame this, this, um, uh, this problem is, is to describe what happens in development programs and ultimately a successful drug has this dose response relationship where you can differentiate an efficacy signal from a toxicity signal um, and this is a therapeutic window. Uh, unfortunately in drug development this happens after uh, many many years and many millions of dollars and, and that's the ultimate test of, of success of, of, of a drug and, and what we'd like to do is to try to move this as early as possible into the drug discovery and development process to try to um, determine dose response at the time a new target is identified at the time a, um, a drug discovery program is, is launched. Um, and human genetics can help with this and, and I'll just walk you through that very quickly. So on the x-axis is gene function and on the y-axis is, is human phenotype. This could be a phenotype um, that's related to um, a disease risk or a quantitative phenotype such as high versus low uh, cholesterol levels. Um, and the very first and the most important step in this process is to pick a phenotype that's relevant um, for drug efficacy. So, so not all clinical phenotypes are relevant um, for drug discovery. I think some, some such as um, risk of diabetes or rheumatoid arthritis uh, do have direct empirical evidence that they're valuable for drug discovery. And other quantitative phenotypes such as LDL cholesterol levels are also good phenotypes. Others may be more difficult. Okay, the next step is then to identify ideally not just one allele uh, but multiple alleles with a range of effect sizes on the human phenotype of interest um, that are correlated or associated or linked to that human phenotype. Um, but in this stage of, the, of this exercise we really don't know anything about gene function so the next step is to assess these alleles for function um, characterizing gain of function uh, or, or loss of function and if you do this you can really begin to sort of at least in theory, um, begin to uh, create an efficacy um, a dose response curve. But human genetics actually has a fairly unique feature and that is pleiotropy and you can ask are these same alleles associated with other phenotypes that may be considered adverse drug events and it, this can be done by linking genetic data and large uh, biobanks that also have clinical data for example electronic healthcare data. Um, and so through pleiotropy, you can use this as, as a proxy for a adverse drug events. And again, this provides um, evidence for a therapeutic window at the very beginning of the drug discovery process. And in theory, if we can find this allelic series and draw these dose response curves, this would be a very promising starting point for a drug discovery uh, screen. Um, so what, what frequently, the question that's frequently asked at this point in the presentation is, Sure, there's PCSK9, but are there any other examples or is that really an exception? Um, and I think there is a growing list of genes with this allelic series and I've highlighted a, a few here. Um, one of the other uh, examples that's prominently cited is NAV1.7 or SCN9A as a phenotype that's related to uh, pain uh, insensitivity and also uh, increased pain uh, sensitivity. Um, but even if you can't find a gene with an allelic series, there's an increasing list of genes with loss of function protective variants um, and I just highlight a few that are actually shown here and several of these have actually led to the development of successful drugs um, such as CCR5 antagonists. Okay, but what to me is probably one of the most exciting aspects of this is that you know, as the cost of sequencing continues to drop, um, we are seeing a much larger number of, of genomes that are being sequenced. I mean, much of this is in the form of whole exome sequencing, but increasingly whole genome sequencing as well. And this trend is going to continue as the cost of genome sequencing drops so that we will make these connections between genetic variants 
and uh, uh, molecular phenotypes and therefore a more accurate molecular understanding of, of human disease. And, and on this slide I'm just highlighting a few of these initiatives um, that are linking human genetic data with clinical phenotypes in a setting um, that's amenable for recall for additional functional studies. I think many people are familiar with, um, uh, with, with BECO genetics in, in Iceland. Um, there's the, the um, uh, Genomics England project uh, to sequence 100,000 uh, individuals. Um, the um, United States has launched their Precision Medicine Initiative. Um, uh, uh, Regeneron has partnered with, with, uh, with Geisinger um, to create a, a similar biobank. And, and there are other examples that are, are shown here and, and many more examples uh, that aren't shown here. So I think, you know, o over the next decade, many, many genomes will be sequenced many connections will be made, and I think many genes will be identified with this allelic series model. Um, I, I said this at, at the beginning, I want to emphasize this as well, is that genetics is one way to establish these causal relationships, um, but there are other ways to establish relationships between perturbations of targets and physiologic outcomes, that is, causal human biology. Um, one example is with autoantibodies, for example, uh, autoimmune thyroid disease, and therefore the therapy here is thyroid replacement. Um, there are examples of repurposing, for example, sildenafil and erectile dysfunction. Um, if experimental medicine studies are done correctly, you can give physiologic challenges, um, such as observing differences in cortisol level and linking that to clinical outcome, in this case, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, this can ha help establish causal relationships. And there are other ways to do longitudinal profiling. So I just highlight some of those examples uh, to make sure that everyone understands that genetics is one way, but it certainly isn't the only way. Um, so the bottom line here is I think increasingly there'll be these large scale studies in humans, for example, genome sequencing, that'll establish causal links between target perturbation and physiologic outcome. Okay. So even once you actually have a target, um, there's of course a very important step in drug discovery and development, which is to develop a um, a, 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 thera a therapeutic molecule that modulates the target in a particular way. I actually won't talk much about that, although that's a very uh, obviously key step in this process. Um, what I will spend a little bit of time on is talking about how we can actually develop biomarkers that measure therapeutic modulation, again, with an emphasis on the, on the human system. And here I'll use the example of base inhibitors in Alzheimer's disease. Um, so just a little bit of background on uh, the history of drug development in Alzheimer's disease. I think one could say, um, in summary, it's, it's not very pretty. <laughs> it is, it is uh, there are particularly high failure rates um, in Alzheimer's disease, uh, even more so than uh, for other complex traits. And, and this study was published in Nature Reviews of Drug Discovery earlier in the year, um, which highlighted the high failure rate in Alzheimer's disease. Um, you know, that's shown this number here, um, compared to the industry average for other um, uh, other uh, therapeutic areas or other indications of interest. Um, there's been this prominent hypothesis around amyloid deposition and risk of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and in the case of, uh, of uh, our Merck has a base inhibitor program, so just to be very clear on that, as do other companies as well. Um, but there's also uh, evidence linking this particular pathway um, to uh, Alzheimer's risk. And so the causal human biology for this particular program is actually not based directly, it's one step removed, and that is the amyloid precursor protein. Um, so the causal human biology here has to do with mutations uh, in this pathway. In particular, there's a mutation um, uh, that reduces Alzheimer's disease risk that is protective, and it has uh, an effect on decreasing a beta cleavage. Um, but there are also um, naturally occurring antibodies that bind to these alpha-beta oligomers and also appear to decrease Alzheimer's risk. So there is some causal uh, evidence that this pathway is related um, to uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease. So the therapeutic hypothesis then is that base inhibition blocks the release of toxic A-beta levels and reduces Alzheimer's disease progression. And the three steps are shown on this slide. Again, protective APP mutations reduce base one cleavage uh, in vitro, and that's shown here. Um, second, in the therapeutic hypothesis, is that base one inhibition will mimic this APP mutation and block the first step in the release of toxic A beta peptides. And that this will then lead, lead to a decrease in A beta oligomers in the brain, 
and therefore protect from Alzheimer's disease. So what I want to focus on here is not necessarily the genetic evidence that implicates this target and this pathway, but I want to emphasize how this can actually be linked to biomarkers to conduct a robust clinical trial. Um, and here what I'm showing is that A beta peptide levels can actually be measured directly in the uh, cerebral spinal fluid, the CSF, and therefore serve as a biomarker, not just a target engagement, but a target modulation. And so this would be a proof of biology, a proof of mechanism, but not necessarily a proof of concept, because for that you need to see um, uh, improvement in Alzheimer's disease itself. So here, you give the drug, you measure, gather CSF, and you may measure the biomarker and ask, does the drug engage and modulate the target in the way that you think it should? And this can be done in healthy volunteers, uh, but it can also be done in patients with Alzheimer's disease. Um, so what I'm showing you here is Merck's compound that lowers A-beta levels in the CSF from healthy volunteers, and that's on the left, and in addition to that, in, in patients with Alzheimer's disease, and that's shown on the right. Um, so with increasing dose of the drug, you can actually see that the levels go down um, of a beta 40 levels in, in the CSF. And I think the important point here is that with therapeutic modulation of base inhibitor with this particular compound, we can get more than 90% um, lowering of A beta levels in the CSF of patients that are healthy or individuals who are healthy and also Alzheimer's patients. Okay, so this, this I think provides a good example of linking the first two steps, um, that is a target rooted in human biology and a biomarker that's based upon uh, human biology. Um, however, and this is actually should be a uh, uppercase H in terms of however, this is a big if, um, the human mutations are an APP and not based directly. So we're actually one step removed away from the human biology evidence. Um, you know, I, I told you, I think, a good story around this relationship between CSF A beta peptide levels and target perturbation, but we don't really know, and we don't have a, for example, an, an established relationship that one could actually use with Mendelian randomization between carriers of these particular mutations and, and a, a beta peptide levels. And ultimately, you know, this is the ultimate test of a therapeutic hypothesis, and the phase three clinical trials are underway, um, and it remains to be determined um, if this therapeutic modulation will have a beneficial effect. Okay. To me, what makes this area very exciting is there are all sorts of new technologies that can be used to measure human physiology. Um, this could be next generation sequencing, there are all sorts of interesting nanotechnology, and so I think increasingly we will be able to measure target modulation in a way that we weren't able to do before. So the bottom line is that an important component of a successful drug discovery program or translational medicine program is to have robust biomarkers to allow proof of mechanism studies in clinical trials, and there are new technologies that are being developed. Okay, so in the last five minutes, I just want to quickly uh, remind you and go over an example of how all three of these can be st stitched together um, to test a therapeutic hypothesis in, 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 in patients in a relatively small um, study design. Um, so here I'll use the example of an approved drug that targets the erection uh, receptor um, and it's a rece erection receptor uh, antagonist. Um, in full disclosure, this is also a Merck drug. Uh, it's called Subarexant, and it's approved as a new therapeutic approach to treat insomnia. Um, I won't go through the, the underlying human biology in detail, uh, but I think it's interesting to note that the causal human biology link here is around not necessarily genetics, but around autoimmune erection deficiency in humans, which results uh, in, uh, in narcolepsy. Um, there is also this interesting connection between genetic deficiency in dogs, uh, which leads to uh, narcolepsy, uh, and the erection pathway is actually conserved across species. So here the therapeutic hypothesis is that erection receptor antagonism will block uh, uh, the uh, wake-promoting cycle and therefore uh, enable sleep, and that's graphically illustrated in the four quadrants on this slide. So in the upper left quadrant, this is what a wake signal looks like. Um, during uh, sleep, um, you can see this system is blocked, um, and this correlates over time with the active and inactive state, and therefore the therapeutic hypothesis is by blocking 
orexin, and this will in induce uh, sleep. And here, I think the most important point to emphasize um, is that a, now a, we have a clinical, not just proof of, of mechanism, but a proof of concept study in healthy, healthy volunteers um, to use polysomnography to measure sleep. And what I find very interesting about this particular example is it was done in, in only uh, 20 individuals. And you can see this relationship between dose of the drug and either total sleep time or a sleep efficiency index. So I think these are the types of things that we want to do going forward. Select targets based on causal human biology, develop robust biomarkers, and get into the clinic as quickly as possible, of course as safely as possible, to test clinical proof of concept. And you know, again, here one of the most exciting things to me is that there are all sorts of new technologies that are being developed um, to measure clinical outcomes, including a variety of tools uh, for real-time patient monitoring. And I just highlight a few here, for example, a content contact lens developed by Google um, that can measure um, uh, glucose. Um, there are all sorts of other mobile technologies um, that can actually link uh, 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 patient-reported outcomes um, uh, to uh, different interventions. And one example is a study done uh, with patients like me um, and Biogen, and that's shown uh, on the right. Um, so here again, the bottom line is that there are new platforms to test not just clinical proof of mechanism, but clinical proof of concept. And hopefully this will allow us to advance novel targets into the clinic. And these technologies are continuing to be developed, and many are actually here today. Um, so I will conclude um, simply by sort of voicing uh, really some, some optimism and excitement about where we are in drug discovery and to say that we do really live in an amazing time where there's a confluence of events centered around human, an understanding of human biology, both for the development of new targets through genetics and other means, the development of robust biomarkers, uh, and also for the ability to test therapeutic hypotheses uh, in humans as quickly and as safely as possible. Um, so with, with that, I will, um, I will stop and be happy to answer uh, any, any questions. Okay, so Robert, um, one of the questions that's come in is, uh, do you envision a time when all clinical trial volunteers will have their, routinely have their genomes sequenced, and at what price point might that happen? Okay, I'll repeat the question um, for Robert. Do you envision a time when all clinical trial volunteers will routinely have their genomes sequenced, and at what price point might that happen? Okay, um, so if, I, if I'm following this correctly, I think uh, I can pull up a, a question number 13. And the question is, uh, do you envision a time when all clinical trial volunteers will, will routinely have their genome sequenced? Um, and, and at what price point could that happen? Um, so I, I, absolutely, I mean, I, it, it's hard for me to imagine a time that this does not happen in, in the future. Um, and I think uh, in terms of the price point, um, given the, the, the cost of, um, uh, given the cost of, of, of exome or genome sequencing, it really is approaching um, you know, the cost of a, of a basic blood test that's you know, somewhere in the range of $500 to $1,000, depending upon, uh, I guess, who, who you talk to. Of course, the data analysis is a, is a totally uh, 
a di different question, and that's actually continues to be quite challenging. But I think you know this is just one example of how these databases will continue to develop over time, um, not just as part of routine patient care, but I think as part of um, uh, uh, clinical trials as well. Okay, Robert, um, hopefully you can hear me now. Is the high failure rate for treating Alzheimer's associated more with the ineffectiveness of the drugs or their inability to, con to cross the blood-brain barrier? Okay, so question um, uh, number 12 uh, is, um, uh, is the high failure rate for treating Alzheimer's, um, is the high failure rate for treating Alzheimer's uh, associated more with the ineffective of the drugs or their inability um, uh, to cross the blood-brain barrier? Um, um, and you know, I think it's uh, I think it's 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 both. I mean, I think in terms of Alzheimer's disease, it's an incredibly um, a complex um, disease process, and we don't know the relationship of you know, causal relationship between target perturbation uh, and, um, and and outcome. So I think that's one uh, important component of the challenges in Alzheimer's disease. Um, it's also a disease that takes many many years to develop, and there's a question of when's the right time uh, to actually intervene. Um, some of the studies that are actually being done in base inhibitor in the base inhibitor trials uh, are, are being done um, really in, in early onset, um, or I should say, in, in patients with uh, mild cognitive impairment, and trying to use um, and I didn't touch upon this, but I should have um, biomarkers for enrichment of patients that are most most likely benefit from uh, these therapeutic interventions. Um, and I think that you know it, it, the blood-brain barrier makes it challenging to develop. Um, uh, drugs that actually access the right um, targets, but there are um, uh, ways in which this, uh, uh, this, this can be done. And so I don't think this in and of itself is, is the major um, uh, barrier for developing uh, uh, drugs in Alzheimer's. I, I really do think it's about um, targets in the time course of disease and understanding uh, human physiology. Any comments on organ on a chip technology? How will it help in drug discovery? Okay, uh, the next question uh, has to do with any comments on organ on a chip technology and how will it help in drug discovery? Um, I, I think there are a number of new technologies such as organ on a chip, um, such as uh, induced pluripotent stem cells or iPSCs. I think all of these are doing a better job of modeling the human system. Um, so I think that they will help us test um, uh, therapeutic molecules and, and, and pathways in a way that it wasn't possible um, before. So I think these technologies are very, very valuable. Um, I think we have to be very careful about the application in terms of identifying new targets. Um, but depending upon the study that's actually done, you can imagine doing, for example, you know, a phenotypic screen where you think a readout in an organ on a chip technology or an iPSC is very valuable to underline human disease process, um, and therefore it could be the starting point of a drug discovery uh, program. But, but, but you know, absolutely, these new technologies, anything that's going to model the human system more effectively, I think, will be um, be very important. Okay, that's all the time we have. Okay, that's all the time we have. Many thanks, Robert, for your fascinating presentation, and thanks to all of you for tuning in. In case you want to watch it again, Robert's talk will be archived and available on demand at the conference website for three months after the live broadcast until December 16, 2015.
Uh, Chris Austin of NIH is up next at the top of the hour, and there are a lot more great talks to come throughout the rest of the afternoon. You can find the full program on the agenda page located at the upper right hand of your side of your screen. And in the meantime, please stop by the virtual exhibit hall in the lounge where you can check out all of our sponsors and exhibitors or network with other attendees. Thanks very much.